Today we're talking about a simple linear model or regression modeling, right? A lot of people find regression models very confusing or intimidating. At the end of this video, I promise you, you're gonna understand the basics and you'll have a basis to build on from there. Okay, so don't go away, pay attention, stick with me. Now I'm working in R here, but it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna do any code. I'm just gonna look at the results. So don't worry about the fact that it's in R. If you were working in any other package, it wouldn't make any difference. The same principles and the same numbers would apply. All right, so we can ignore the fact that it's R. People get a little bit nervous about R and coding and it's actually not super duper easy. But anyway, here we go. We've got a model. Okay, we've got some data and uh, we've got the speed of cars and we've got the distance that it takes for the car to stop. Okay, to understand this model, let's go to the data itself. We've got this data set called cars, right? And it's got speed, speed of cars, and I think it's in miles. I don't, like I, I you know, forgive me if I use kilo, kilometers instead of miles, anyway, and distance to stop. Well, the question is, is it the case that the faster you travel, the longer it'll take you to stop if you need to? Right? And I think intuitively we all agree, yes, that's probably the case, but let's see if that is borne out by the data. So we can take this data and we can put it on a Cartesian plane. We can plot it, the x-axis, which is the independent variable. In other words, it doesn't, speed doesn't depend on stopping time. So it's the independent variable is the x-axis. The dependent variable, distance taken to stop, is on the y-axis. So, it so the, the value of y depends on the value of x, we think. And, you know, that's what we're proposing in this model. And we can plot all of our observations on this Cartesian plane. Each observation has an X and a Y value. Okay, super duper easy. You with me so far? Of course you are. And then we can plot a best fit line. And I'm not going to get into the mathematics of how you plot a best fit line. You can just take it for granted that this line is the best, best possible fit through this data, right? And it seems to me, and I'm sure it seems to you, that there's an upward slope. Doesn't it look like that? It looks like there's an upward slope here. Now, how do we know if that's real or not? Well, let's find out. What we do is we create a little model and I'll show you how to do that. I mean, don't worry about the code here, it's in R, but I basically do that and voila, up comes a whole lot of numbers. And the big question is, how do we interpret these numbers? How do we answer certain questions about this data from those numbers? And I'm gonna talk you through that right now. Of all the numbers that pop up from the, from the model, there's only four that you really need to understand if you want to really understand this model that'll answer the most obvious questions that you might be asking. There's more stuff in there, but let's just stick with the basics here, right? There's four possible, four or five possible questions we could be asking. The one is, what is, what is this line, what is the slope of this line and how meaningful is that, right? Okay, so the model gives us the slope. Here it is, is one of the, the coefficients next to speed, 3.9. I've popped it over here. Slope is 3.9. What does that mean? Well, it means that the model is suggesting that for every movement, one unit on the x-axis, there's a movement of three units on the y-axis. That's, that's how you get a slope of 3.9 or movement of 3.9 units on the y-axis. So for every increase in speed of one mile per hour, there's an increase of 3.9 feet that's required to stop the car if you need to. Interesting, right? And that's what gives us the slope of the line. We also get a y-intercept that's over here at the other coefficient. Now, in this case, the y-intercept is minus 17. Keep in mind, very often in a linear model, the y-intercept is a meaningless number. We need the y-intercept because you can't draw the line without a slope and a y-intercept, right? So you, it, it, it is a number that's needed for the model. But in the real world, very often, the y-intercept doesn't have any meaningful interpretation. In other words, you can't, a distance to stop can't be negative 17 meters, right? So, you know, the y-intercept is the, is, is the theoretical value of y when the speed of car, this car is zero when the x, x is zero, okay? So fair enough, we've got a y-intercept, we're not gonna interpret it, but we know that we need it in order to, to, to create the model. There are some times where, in actual fact, that is the very question you're trying to ask. So there's certain data sets for which, what is the y-intercept when, you know, when, when x is zero, that is the question that you might be asking. And if it is, if it is the question you're asking, Voila, for sure, we've got a p-value, we've got all, the, all of the usual statistical stuff that you might be interested in with respect to that y-intercept, but in this particular model, not interested, not important, irrelevant. So we've got a slope, 3.9, right? And here it is in the model here. We've also got a p-value for that slope, and I've popped it here, p-value for the slope. What does that mean? Well, a 
p-value, now you will be familiar with hypothesis testing, right? And we've, we've, used, we've talked about hypothesis testing before. Now, the null hypothesis here would be that the slope is zero, that there is no relationship up or down, that there's no change in y with a change in x, up or down, right? That the, the, so that the slope is zero, that would, that would give us a slope of zero, that's the null hypothesis, and the way hypothesis testing works is this. If the null hypothesis were true, let's assume it's true. Let's assume that there's no slope. Well, the slope is zero. If that were the case, and we were to take a random sample, what's the probability that that random sample would give us a slope of 3.9? So it's certainly possible, but it's very unlikely. Well, we'd think that it's very unlikely. Now, Hypothesis testing works like this. There's a threshold after which very unlikely becomes sufficient evidence to reject that null hypothesis, to reject the notion that there's no slope, that the slope is zero, and to accept the fact that the slope that we're seeing is in fact real, that it is statistically significant, that we can use that fact to make inference about the wider population from which the sample was drawn. Okay, you got it? Okay, and, and that, that threshold, we call that the alpha value, uh, it, we often, it's often 5%, so if the p-value is less than 5, the probability of getting this sample is less than 5. Well, a sample with a slope that's as different from 0 as this okay, is less than 5%, then we reject the null and we accept the fact that this is real. Okay, you got it? So this p-value, in this case, the p-value is extremely small, p-value of, of 1.9 times 10 to the power of negative 12, that's 0 0.0000000, so it's an extremely small number. Of course, it's less than 5%, so we can reject the null and accept the fact that not only do we have a slope and we know what the slope is, but we think that this is statistically significant, right, that the slope is real. Okay, you got it? Good, let's keep going. We've discussed the, the y-intercept, the slope, the p-value, and what is this over here, the r squared? Now, r squared tells us one thing. It's very interesting. It says to us, how much of the change in y that we're seeing can be explained by a change in x, right? And the reason we say that is we're not going to be able to explain all of the change in distance taken to stop. It's not all going to be explained by the speed of the car. There may be multiple other variables that we don't have access to that will contribute to this change in, uh, you know, changes in Y, distance taken to stop. It might be the, the kind of road that you're on, the person that's driving, the reaction speed, the time of day. There might be all sorts of variables. And if we had more variables, we could start building them into our model. But we're, very un we're unlikely to ever have all of the variables, every single factor that could possibly contribute to the dependent variable, right? There's always going to be an element of like how much of the change in y can we explain by the change in x. In this case, we've only got one variable. It's a simple model. We've only got the speed of the car, so we're never going to explain all of the all of the change in the y variable, but we can explain quite a lot because this r squared is, an, is, is a number between 0 and 1, right? So 0 0.65, that's 65%. 65% of the change in the distance taken to stop can be explained by a change in the speed of the car. And that is really interesting. So whatever software you're using, when you do a simple model and running the model in whatever software you, you're using will be easy. You could see that it was just like a line of code in R and a lot of software, it's a click of a button. Running the model is easy. Interpreting the results can be tricky because it gives you so much and you sort of think, well, where do I start? Well, the place to start is just these four numbers, the y-intercept, usually meaningless, but you, so you can ignore it, the slope, the p-value associated with that slope, right? We want to know that it's statistically significant, and then the r-squared, which tells us the extent to which or how much of the change in y can be explained by a change in x. When we start add, and the f, okay, the, there's a few more numbers. I'll just tell you what they are quickly so, you, so you've got a sense of them. The adjusted r-squared. Now, if you add in additional variables into the model, uh, you need to start looking at the adjusted R squared instead of just the R squared because uh, the, the, we won't get into the maths behind it, but uh, the, 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 the adjusted R squared will give you a better sense of the extent to which a change in X uh, explains a change in Y. So we adjust it for the number of additional variables. It's adjusting for the degrees of freedom, but you don't need to know about that right now. Uh, the F statistic is also important as we start adding additional variables because it tells us 
the the extent to which the overall model is 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 a good fit is 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 uh, is, is meaningful. Um, these residuals now, what the residuals are. You see, we've got our model here, but it's quite clear that not all of the values lie exactly on the model. In fact, most of them don't. For each observation, there is a distance between that observation and what the model kind of suggests that observation should be if, if, it, if, if it fitted perfectly. Uh, and that, di that difference is the residual. Okay, And we expect the residuals to be sort of symmetrically distributed around zero. So this isn't bad. This is If you look at the interquartile range, it's sort of uh, nine on either side. Uh, and you, you, but you would check this quite carefully if you were to kind of uh, place any weight on the model. Okay, I hope that was useful. Stay and watch another video. I've got a statistics cheat sheet that you can download for free, and that's going to give you, you know, which tests to do when. It's kind of quite useful. I think you'll find it quite, quite handy. So you can download that for free, of course. Uh, click on subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Uh, the bell notification for notification of future videos. Share this video with other people if you think they'll find it useful. Don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. Stay well. Speak to you soon. See you again.